Hello, and welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. On this episode, I had the pleasure of talking to bassist Peter Seymour of the group Project Trio. If you have never heard of Project Trio, you simply must go check out their videos. They are one of the most dynamic, interesting, and fun groups to listen to and watch. The group is made up of bass, cello, and flute. All the players bring so much to the table, and I specifically have to mention that the flute player brings his signature beatboxing style to the mix. It's so much fun. Peter and I had a chance to talk about what it was like for him to completely switch over to playing music outside of the orchestra for his career, as well as the ins and outs of running an ensemble, which is essentially running a business. Let's get started. Hey, Peter, how are you? I'm doing great. Nice to talk. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. So, um, you know, we met way back um, in a gig on the Key West Symphony. And I just remember this, what stands out in my mind the most is that I was, I glanced up and, and I saw you looking around and you smiled at me. And I was like, what's going on here? You know, like in an orchestra, people don't usually make eye can contact with that each was, other. That was always one of my signature moves when I was an orchestral musician. So <laughs> I like to catch anybody I can. And so, <laughs> and, and you can, because, you know, you're only catching people one at a time. It's not like everyone's looking around. So I would always just wait for someone to be <laughs> looking around. It was awesome. I was like, wait a second. This is fun. This is more fun. <laughs> well, Why don't we do this? You know, also, when you're sitting in the bass section, you have a little more opportunity to look around and stuff. So I always <laughs> had a unique job in that I was sitting in the back. Um, and of course, I had an important job, but I wouldn't say that it's the most high stress job um, of everyone playing in the orchestra. So I felt one of my uh, most important jobs was to look around and smile and uh, possibly uh, try to make music with anyone up there who was, uh, who was also looking around. That's cool. I I really like it. And then since since that experience, you know, I, you know, started um watching some interviews of yours and stuff and and you said that you like to create you liked to create like a chamber music feel, which was harder to do in an orchestra, but now you do that. So tell me tell me more about Project Trio. Yeah. Um so Project Trio is uh is uh, an ensemble that's we're in our tenth season actually now, so it's a uh, oh wow it's been around for a while. Uh, myself um, and my uh, my colleagues Greg Patillo, flute player Eric Stevenson, cellist. Uh, we actually met at the Cleveland Institute of Music um, almost twenty years ago, and you know we were good friends back then, and um, of course we were all uh, studying to be. Uh, um, orchestral uh, giants one day but um you know we also all enjoyed making all kinds of different types of music all three of us have have really diverse backgrounds in our music making and um and you know we used to play music together back then and uh, about 10 years ago uh, our our paths uh, seem to collide again to kind of start an ensemble and start our own business. Uh, we all found ourselves in New York City from different uh, different paths, and uh, we've been we've been going strong ever since. The ensemble plays uh, truly diverse music. Um, we use kind of our classical training and um, you know our classical sensibility to write and arrange music that's more in the style of today and, um, you know, kind of using elements of all different styles of music. It's one of our favorite things is to try to incorporate as many different styles of music as possible. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're out there playing all over the world. So it's been a fun and crazy ride. That's so great. So, so initially, everyone in your group thought, like you said, you were you were geared up to go w be big time in the orchestra world. Were you guys all with the intention of going on the audition track and winning a job somewhere? Absolutely. You know, when you go somewhere like the Cleveland Institute of Music, uh, you're you're not given that many other choices, um, which is not a bad thing. In that, I do feel that. Um, uh, while we didn't 
make it to our um, original final destination. Um, we actually, you know, made it into a career uh, that that was more meant for us. And I do think that a lot of the things that we did along the way to become uh to try to become you know top orchestral players i think has certainly helped us in the the realm of what we do now especially in that i don't think that there's any preparation that i've done on my on my individual instrument that could ever um come close to the type of preparation i used to do for uh preparing for all the different auditions that I took. Um, and so certainly um, mastering the instrument uh, was, was something that, that we all gained while, you know, working towards a goal of trying to become an orchestral musician. Um, and, you know, really just, uh, you know, our, our, our paths changed and we'll, we can talk more about it, but um, definitely those were our, all three of our goals while we were in college. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, did, did you have a particular, um, audition that you were just like, you thought this was going to be the, the one and then it didn't happen or like, what was there, was there a, was there a, a gradual kind of process that you, you thought you were going towards? Maybe I don't want to do this or was it a sudden thing? Like, you know, no, this isn't what I want. It's a good question. And it's, and it's, Every, I think everything's gradual. I don't think, you know, the sudden. Um, right. I I mean, to be completely honest, I was never that great of an auditioner. I, I never had that, um, that much uh, success at auditions. And I felt that my style of playing was not, you know, coming through um, behind the screen uh, for, for different reasons. I had a very unique opportunity uh, to play as a one-year substitute player in the Cleveland Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was incredible. And it was with, you know, in my college home, in my conservatory hometown with all of kind of my orchestral heroes and friends and colleagues that, you know, that I've known for so long and, uh, you know, an incredible orchestra. And no question that when the audition came up for that, you know, I was in a one year kind of position. And then when they had the national audition, um, and I didn't win, there was no question that that was a real moment where I was like, I want to do something else. I've, you know, I've, I've, I've been able to fulfill my, you know, dream of playing with, you know, some of the great orchestral players and, and getting to do exciting things like go on tours and play on recordings with the with the orchestra and after that audition and that experience I, I really did feel that you know it was it was my time to do something and if I wasn't going to do something musical then I was going to have to do something else with my life um, that wasn't going to be playing the bass. That doesn't mean that it wouldn't have been in music, but that, so, so I think there was a gradual, um, you know, uh, it was like a, a gradual time getting to that. And certainly that audition, uh, that audition was the last audition I took and the last audition I will take. Awesome. And did that, when you, when you, um, like you just said, that's the last audition I will take. Was there ever an emotional, um, like backlash I'd say, or something, some kind of feeling like, oh no, you know, I mean, you're doing such great stuff now. And so you can look back on that and say, now I have project trio. This is really me. And this is who I am and what I'm doing. But like, was there, was there ever a moment of like, uh oh shit, you know, I, yeah. I, studied all this stuff, especially to be in an orchestra. And this was my in original intention. And like, was there like a, you know, you know, some kind of a conflict inside about that or not? You know, I had a very unique experience. And, and so I guess there was a, a moment that I do recall. And we actually, it's kind of crazy. And I'll tell the long story short, but the, the <laughs> Cleveland Orchestra National Audition happened the day before Cleveland Orchestra was going to go on tour with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And so 
uh, the night of the audition, you know, after the audition was over, the orchestra played Beethoven 9. And the next day we were going to leave for tour. And it was this amazing thing in that the audition happened and I didn't win. And actually a really close friend of mine won. And all the bass players from all over the country were all in town. And they all came to see the Beethoven Ninth Symphony that night. And, I, and then afterwards, we all went out to the bar and hung out and uh, celebrated, you know, just being with friends and celebrated Scott winning. And, you know, I actually went out to the parking lot after that concert. And for whatever reason, I actually had such a, a great feeling. I, I felt I felt feelings of pride and feelings of excitement of the future. And and so I didn't have the feelings of distress you were asking about. I more for some reason had a a very positive feeling. And I don't know why I was so positive. I don't know if I should have been, but I, for some reason I did feel positive that day. And uh I will say that, you know, that that from that day forward my my life was much different than it was uh, before that. That's interesting. So it was a marker in yeah. your life, and 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 it was a good thing. And it, I mean, yeah. obviously, it's a good thing. But I love that it was that you had this realization that um, you know different things were coming, and it wasn't sad for you. Yeah. I love that. I yeah. love that. I'm not sure why it wasn't, but you know. That's, uh, you knew there know. was a knowing. I think there was a knowing, and you, you maybe you didn't know what. Yeah, but there was some kind of knowing, yes. which is, which is fantastic. Yeah. So did did um, playing other genres and improvising and writing did that always come naturally to you, or did you study it, or or you know how did that come about where you're just making up new yeah. stuff? I never really studied improvisation or playing uh, other styles. I I um. I was fortunate to go to a really great high school uh, in Dallas, Texas, where I'm from. The uh, Arts Magnet High School in Dallas um, had an incredible jazz program. And being a bass player, um, I was kind of thrust into it as, you know, a ninth grader. And so, um, so I think from a young age, I just got put into uh, some really good situations. And, um, and so... You know, from there, the the fear was gone. One thing that we're out there teaching is that, you know, a lot of times with improvisation, the first time is incredibly hard. And then the second time is not as hard as the first time. And it continues on like that. And so if you can be introduced to it from a young age, by the time you are an older person that's set in your ways, a lot of the fear is gone from it. And so... um and then after high school, I actually had plenty of jazz opportunities, but I still love classical music and I loved, you know, even just uh, uh, the challenges because, um, and so, you know, I chose to go the, the classical route, but yeah, I had been introduced to it from a young age. That's great. Yeah. Cause I know how uncomfortable I feel when uh, they even expect us to swing something. I'm like, oh, yeah. uh. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> which, <laughs> which is embarrassing to say, but. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so what was the um what was the transition like for um you know, or was there sort of a transition mentally when you're a self employed, you know, you're you're running a business now as as Project yeah. Trio. And it's that's totally different from just, you know, showing up to a gig and then getting paid for it. So what what's what's the biggest challenge of um of that lifestyle? Well, the biggest challenge is having to, you know, that you really are relying on yourself. You're not relying on an organization that already exists. Um, you know, you you don't have, you know, as a musician, you're used to just kind of playing music. And so now you really do have to do um, everything. And so I'd say that's the biggest challenge. And I will say it's the greatest part about it. You know, it's actually, it's so, uh, I think so many times people, they come to me and they say, oh, you know, you have to do all this business stuff. It's, uh, why do you have to do all that? And, you know, honestly, it's some of the most creative work that you can do. Playing the music is highly creative and incredible, but creating something that, that, puts you on the stage, you know, doing all that work that gets you to being able to play all these concerts, I found 
just truly exciting and highly, highly creative. And so, um, I don't know if that answered the, the, the question. No, it totally does because you know it's it's like a it's like a total ownership of the concert, right? Because yeah, you're in charge of finding the people to come, marketing it, um, you know, coming up with it from start to finish. And I feel like as you know, from from my background as a classical musician, just when you, all you have to do is show up, yeah, and there's no connection to the audience. You almost you almost forget they're there because yeah. your job is just to come and play. And so like there's, I can see how there would be such a deeper fulfillment of like, you know, I went out, I found these people, mm-hmm. you know, and you're talking about it and this is something you created. So you're already excited and passionate about it. You love what you're about to do. And there's that, it, that's, and that, that creates connection with the audience. I, I just think there's a lot there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot missing in the classical world where that's concerned with audience connection. Oh, most definitely. And I will say, um, in defense of orchestra in that realm, it is hard to connect. You know, you got a hundred people on stage, and everyone's you know is like reading this. You know, you've only rehearsed four times or something, and then you're doing the even when you're playing in a you know. A, a full-time orchestra, you know, you still only had the week of rehearsal and then you're, right. you know, you're going out. And so, you know, I understand everyone's concentrating at a super high level and stuff and it's not set up for you to be like the whole thing is not set up to be connecting with your audience. Right. Now I think in chamber music, it's really quite a different thing. I think actually that is set up to be interacting with your audience. Uh, one of our first and earliest choices that we made is that we would do everything from memory. Um, oh, wow. Uh, now, we write and arrange all of our own music. So I wouldn't say it's as, it's not as hard. It's like if you're trying to memorize all of these mm-hmm. string quartets or you know whatever pieces you're playing. But that said, we made a choice then we were going to do everything from memory. And now when we go out on stage, we look right at our audience. We face the audience. We get, we're like in a semicircle and, you know, we kind of can see each other, but our main thing is making sure that our audience can see us and that we can see them and look at them and smile at them or make intense faces at them or whatever <laughs> needs to be done. And sometimes the fourth wall is up. Because they should be, you know, seeing us making music together. And then sometimes we break it down because we're making music with you. Um, but there's no question that uh, that, that was an early choice um, that we just said we're, we're not going to do it. And it was because we had an experience where we had half of our program memorized and then we were going to use stands for the other half. And honestly, the second half of it, the, the part that we used stands, it like fell so f- it fell flat it was not the same experience and we just said never again and actually we even took it we just um we just had a concerto commission for the ensemble by adam schoenberg who is a composer a oh, wow. great great composer and he wrote us an incredible concerto and the very first thing that we told him when we were even talking about what we're going to do in the piece is that it would be memorized and we were going to play this concerto from memory and we went out there and that's what we did and completely owned it and owned the stage and and uh and it was a real challenge but it's just part of what we do and so i think that's helped extremely in our ability to connect with our audiences um so away from orchestral musicians if anyone's out there listening and they are uh they're uh you know playing chamber music or these if you can do it and the thing is, is you can. Uh, I think, you know, I think there's there's actually is a lot of, you know, very classical groups that are now out there memorizing string quartets and things. And how powerful. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. It just, it's, I swear, when you, when you take that music stand away, the audience, they think you are creating it right there on the spot. Our music, sometimes people ask how much of it's improvised. And actually, funny enough, not that much of it is. There's a lot of improvisation that goes into the composition side of it. But once we're performing, I mean, we're performing music that we've written. It just looks like we're making it up up there. And I think the same happens when you see someone play a concerto with an orchestra. When they have the music in front of them, it's one experience. And when they're out there with no music, it is completely different. 
especially for people who don't know, who are not, you know, who haven't studied music. They're there for entertainment and enjoyment and, you know, and for art sake and all of these things. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, something I haven't uh, thought about that much, to be honest. So that's. Yeah. Well, and like I said, it's not, uh, you know, it's tough. Um, but I do think like, I've thought about this a lot. Like, uh, I have some, I have, you know, a bunch of friends who are in business and doing stuff. And, you know, I feel like hypothetically, if you were to have even a, a new chamber orchestra that's out there performing, well, if the orchestra were to choose to have one piece per season, if an orchestra did this, a, sim- a, full, uh, a full-time symphony orchestra decided that next year, we were going to perform Beethoven's Fifth Symphony from memory. And then every year you added a piece. And then that was just part of the job is that, you know, if you were a new person, you just had to memorize the pieces that everyone knows. After 20 years, you would know all of this repertoire and you would be able to perform it. Um, but since it's not asked of us, we don't do it. Oh, my God. That it's, would be amazing. It's actually it's really not that hard. And funny enough, I actually think that any any uh, accomplished classical musician could easily memorize um, anything that they put their mind to. Because everyone, you know, we're all out there memorizing our solo works until we're through college. And, you know, people are performing their, you know, recitals or performing for concerto competitions from memory. Like, it's not, you know, you're playing Bach suites from memory. And so it's like, it's not that hard. It, You know, and again, it's just like improvisation. The first piece you memorize is really hard. The second one, it's not as hard. The third piece, it's not as hard, especially if you choose the right repertoire to be memorizing. You know, you're not going to memorize like some Webern or Bear. You're (laughs) going to memorize, you know, Brahms' First Symphony. And the whole orchestra just goes out there and kills it. Memorize Brahms' First Symphony. It'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be that would be amazing. Yeah. So, who, who have you performed, um, or where have you performed the Schoenberg piece? By the way, lucky guy to be a composer, and his last name is Schoenberg. So. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, abs- no question that that uh, <laughs> that it's actually a funny anecdote. We uh, it was on the uh, on the website. We played it with the Charleston Symphony. Was one of the orchestras okay. that commissioned it. And I got on the website and I looked, and it said, um, it said. Schoenberg Concerto, arranged by Project Trio. And I called them and I was like, you know, I really think that this thing needs to say, you know, Adam Schoenberg Concerto for Project Trio. I was like, because Schoenberg Concerto, arranged by Project Trio is really, you know, first of all, it's inaccurate. And that could also (laughs) certainly scare someone, you know? (laughs) Uh, The Concerto was commissioned by four orchestras. Uh, The Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra was the lead. Uh, Iris Orchestra in Memphis with Michael Stern. Um, (coughs) Charleston Symphony and the Amarillo Symphony um, were our four commissioners. Great. They were awesome for for signing on and making it happen. I have to say this was also um, in the spirit of being entrepreneurs. Adam and I... Um, were introduced by our really great friend and conductor and incredible musician, Giacomo Bairos. Yes, um, he was my first interview. Yes, so you know yes. Giacomo. Well, Giacomo introduced us, and Giacomo uh, uh, you know, is conducting Amarillo and said that they would be part of it. And from there, Adam and I put this thing together. You know, we found people, we wrote to orchestras all over the country and we were, you know, through a lot of hard work, we were able to find four. There were a couple others that were on, you know, thinking about it and found orchestras to commission this. And we put this whole thing together and it wasn't done uh, with agents. It wasn't done with um, um, management. It was done with, with, with us, you know, and, uh, and it was a really, really incredible thing. And it's again, going back to, you know, we'd worked on it for three years. And so finally, in the performance, you'd think it would be this incredibly nervous night to perform this concerto, but nothing was, it was, it was so incredible for me personally, just to be standing up there and playing this piece that we put together for three years. It was more just like putting icing on top of the cake. I was, you know, nerves weren't there. It was more of a, you know, finally we were here at the moment. It was, it was, um, it was wonderful. Um, 
Yeah, so it's a great piece. And now, uh, yeah, now we're actively booking it for um, for um, some more seasons, and uh, we have a few uh, few things in the works. Uh, we're going to be playing it in Europe, in Germany, and uh, with a few other orchestras that I can't announce just yet. But uh, but things are things are happening with that, and we're uh, and uh, we're actually right now in St. Louis. Uh, we're performing with the St. Louis Symphony today. Um, on a family concert, playing a lot of our original works and original uh, arrangements, which is also a big part of what we do with orchestras. Yes, very cool. So yeah, that's one one of my next questions. I wanted to know more about your educational component because I know you do a lot of educational stuff. Absolutely. We <laughs> we love doing the education. We have played for <laughs> over four hundred thousand students in the last ten years, if not oh more. My God. If not more, and wow. from the very, very beginning of our ensemble, um, we knew that it was going to be a large part of what we do. Uh, not only because, um, it, not only because it's really important work, fun work, uh, you know, something that myself and the guys are super dedicated to, but also from a uh, you know pure business uh, side of things, uh, we knew we needed to be versatile and and flexible. And I will say that our education work has made the ensemble who we are and what we are. Um, doing all of these concerts, playing thousands and thousands of schools and gymnasiums and cafeterias. I mean, one of the reasons that we do all of our stuff from memory is that if you show up to a school in the gymnasium, what are we going to do? Bring spring stands with us and then bring the music with us and bring this. No, you just have to be ready to do anything. Yeah. And that was a huge part of just kind of a lot of decision making. And I swear, if you can entertain a thousand kids um, in a gym, <laughs> then you can easily play a concert for adults on any con in any concert hall or stage anywhere in the world because those people are there to hear music. It's actually yeah. easy to play a concert for people because – you have a willing audience, you know, you have people who are quiet and they'll listen and they'll, even if they don't like it, they'll clap <laughs> respectively at the end. Whereas with kids, it's not like that, you know, really, you're like up there working hard, you know, it's right. like, you know, you got to control, you know, you get, they put you K through sixth in the same gym. And then, you know, you're trying to keep the yeah. kindergartners quiet while projecting to the back to the older kids. So we learned so much about ourselves and <laughs> what it was like to play music. And then also we learned so much repertoire. Like, you know, this whole like memorization thing, we try out all of our music on the education shows. So if we write a new piece or we have a new, you know, thing, uh, even we've, uh, we've commissioned work for, for our trio, just the trio, we go and we try it out in the schools and we play it in the schools, you know, five or 10 times. And then once it feels good, we bring it to the stage. And so it's also just like a great opportunity to be workshopping music because it's all great music. And really, the most important thing about being doing education is being there. It, it doesn't – you want to play at the highest level always. But for the kids, it doesn't even matter what you play. Being there with your instrument, playing it for them, and talking about it, and talking about music, and showing your love, and answering their questions, and letting them see a person play right in front of them. That is the power of it. Um, miss a couple notes. They, it doesn't matter. You know, play something new that you're not as comfortable with. It doesn't matter. And again, we still, we strive to be playing at our highest level, you know, at all times. And that's another thing. 7 a.m. in Jasper, Indiana, in the cafetorium, you're going to find out what you're made of. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. Totally. Well, and I can imagine that the um, the memorization component for being in front of students makes a huge difference because you're you're connecting. Like if you have those stands and you have that kind of wall between you, um, I could see how the students can immediately check out. Like, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to space out during this. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. This thing I have to go to or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I just uh, you know I um, just go do it. It's like, it's like the memorization. 
or it's like the uh, the improvisation. Uh, the first one is hard. The next one is not so hard. And then the next one, and then it becomes, you know, and I think there's a lot of people that, you know, they want to do education. They, you know, they, they you know, obviously I think everyone thinks it's important. There ain't no one out there that's like, nah, music education isn't important. You know, everyone thinks it's important. But, um, you know, a lot of people I do think have, they just don't know what to do. Like, what is it? How do you even start doing it? It's like, well, you know how you start doing it? You call a school, you go do it. And right. um, if you're in a position where you're in a symphony orchestra, then you're in a great position. Call up and even go do one for free. It, eventually, get paid, and I'm sure that your orchestra will even pay. If you're in a position where you're, um, you know, you're trying to create a business, trying to create an education initiative, if you're right at the beginning, then go just call up some schools and go play. No one will ever say no to musicians that want to play some free music for the students. You know, um, right. I have a lot of thoughts on this, but it's, it's really long winded. If there is every, anybody out there who is listening that is interested in kind of starting their education initiative, projecttrio.com goes right to me, Peter at what is project.org. I am happy to talk about this stuff and getting it started. It's too long to talk about now, but it's not, it's just, it's really easy. And I'll tell you this, today we're playing with the St. Louis Symphony and we're going to have a sold out crowd at Powell Hall and we're playing original music uh, in front of one of my favorite orchestras in the country. And this all started with us playing our first education show. We played the first one in Cleveland, Ohio. And then everywhere we went, we played all these education shows. And honestly, we're playing practically the same show that we did back then, but now just with orchestras. And we truly did grow that education initiative that just started with going into classrooms and playing music, grew it into now. We've been fortunate to play with all kinds of symphony orchestras and playing residencies at, you know, major universities and things. So you never know what your building is going to grow into. Um, right. And Some all I'm saying is that a concert in a classroom can grow into playing in front of a, a, a great orchestra. It absolutely can. That is so inspiring. So would you say that um, what you just said about just starting education, would you apply that advice to, to really any project, like anyone who wants to start their own ensemble, or even if there's an educational component or not, just like to just start. I mean, sometimes people sit around and go, I don't know what to do. I don't know this. I don't know that, yeah. you know, so what, what do you say to that when If someone says, you know, Peter, I, I love what you guys do. And I, I would love to start my own, you know, kind mm -hmm. of ensemble. What do, what do yeah. you say to people that say stuff there's, like that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the, uh... It's a nice sentiment to just say, yeah, just start. And I right. do think that that is what you do. Now, there are there is a lot of things that go into starting a new ensemble. Um, but what I would suggest is sitting uh, either by yourself or with your colleagues who you want to start with and, you know, spend a day, five days, a week, and, like, talk and write everything down and like make make extensive notes about what you want to be and like dream extremely big and talk about all of the things and th this can happen by yourself too one of the very first th and the, what i'm saying is one of the first things that i did is i you know i thought about what it is and then eventually strangely enough i kind of like wrote and wrote, and I wrote out like, I mean, it was almost like a project trio manifesto in that mm -hmm. I like got all these ideas out. And then once I had that, and it didn't take that long, it's not something you need to work on for a year. It's just like getting ideas out about your dreams of who you want to be. And then it is then looking at that, looking at all of these ideas, and then starting to make specific goals. And those goals are things that can happen, things that need to happen immediately, 
things that need to happen in kind of the short term. You know, we need to get these things done. And then having like a list of these kind of longer term goals and maybe what some of the steps are that you need to get for those. And then honestly, then it's what you do. Then you just start. And I am still, I mean, I, you know, I still do all the booking and tour management for our ensemble. Uh, We don't have an agent. We don't have a manager. And actually, everybody in the group has different jobs. You know, we all do all the all the work. And every day, I make lists of things that I need to do. And then I go down and I do the list. And some of the list, you know, it doesn't get done. And I sometimes then make a note next to it why it didn't get done. It did not get done because I just didn't have time. It did not get done because, honestly, I need to do this next Tuesday instead of today. You know, some things don't need to get done on that day. But I'm making lists at all times. And then, basically, I'm trying to go in and take care of the list. And I make new lists. Actually, it's nice. You know, now we're in 2017. And I make full-on lists now every year of things I want to do this year. And I have lists from when we started or lists that are what I want to do over the next five years. And so, obviously, I'm very into lists. And, <laughs> and But, like, basically, however you want to make your list is fine. You know, it's like, but if you don't have these goals written out and, and, and down, they don't have to be written if you don't have typed out or however – then yeah. it's impossible to tackle. And let me just say one more thing about this. Where I learned to do all this, and this goes back to classical training, being prepared to do an audition, I honestly think I learned to do all this preparing for orchestra auditions and preparing for recitals. Uh, and it's why when people say, you know, there's, you know, musicians, you know, we, we think differently. And it's, it's one of the best things someone can do with their time, even if they're not trying to come, become a professional musician is because you learn so much about how you how to be super critical of yourself and how to like fix problems you know practicing is all about fixing problems and that's Mm -hmm. just like running a business so you know I was very into practice logs when I was practicing and I would you know after lessons I would write down stuff and I would try to get something done week to week and month to month and over years and I take all of that and I put it directly into what I do in the business realm. Awesome. So you 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 came to the business realm with a really organizational um, habit. Yeah. 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 And absolutely. And there's no person that there's no person that's uh, um, you know gets to the and you know this because we all know nobody is not. Um, Basically, if you're not practicing hard and, and being organized about it, most likely you're not, you know, you're not making it out there. Right. Because yeah. it's so damn hard. There's, you know, everyone's, everyone's so incredible at playing that, you know, if, if you're not a... So, yeah, organization is certainly... A, it's a, organization's top priority. If you're not an organized person, then you either need to figure out how to be an organized person, which I would suggest, uh, you know reading some books about it but if you're an or and if you already because if you're not organized then you're not going to run a good business and right. if you are organized then you already have one of the important things that you need yes yeah i could see that because there's so much to do i mean and you're incredible amount it's amazing to do. it's amazing that you don't have a manager or anybody that um that that does the stuff for you that you do it yourself that's and incredible. it's because i like it Right. You know, actually, we've had plenty of managers and things approach us. And we've just, and we've had, we've had lots of people over the years. We've had agents. I have, you know, and I do have agents that I work with on a freelance basis. We have an awesome agent in uh, Europe that does a lot of great work for us. I have a person here in the States uh, that does great freelance stuff for us. Uh, We had a PR firm that worked for us for three years, and I learned so much uh, from the, from the CEO of the firm, you know, so it's not, you know, I'm certainly not saying by any means we've done it all ourselves, but, um, I've never wanted to give over and sure. If we maybe had a, a, a great agent or someone, maybe we would be, uh, getting better gigs or something. Maybe I don't know, but 
you know, honestly, then someone else would be running it. And that's right. not, as, not as fun. <laughs> not then as all, fun. Then all I would be doing is just showing up and playing the concerts. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't want to do just that. <laughs> So when you when you first started, um, were you using? I mean, I know that you use social media and YouTube and everything, and you still do. But was there like a moment where something went viral, and then all of a sudden, like everyone knew about Project Trio, or or uh, how did that? Yeah, how did that way back in the beginning? The uh, the for anybody who knows our group and people who don't know our group, uh, our our flutist is incredible. He is, yeah. he is an, I mean, we're all great musicians and our cellist is, is, a, is an absolute genius. I, but our, our flutist has very unique style of playing. And 10 years ago, when YouTube first started, there was barely even YouTube. He was playing music in the subways of New York City and working at Trader Joe's. And that's what he did. Um, wow. And he decided that he was going to make videos uh, to kind of be a calling card, just so when he said beatbox flute, so he could just say, oh, go watch this video. And he put it up, and in the early days of YouTube, he got featured, and it got one of the very first viral videos that I personally even remember. Um, wow. Uh, and so uh, early on, uh, we had a viral video. And, um, you know, we took that and and ran with it. And... Um, uh, I will say that I think that uh, Greg has taught me quite a bit about uh, about music, and I'm so happy to have him and Eric as as colleagues. And one of the things Greg has always been all about is creating content and putting it out there. And does it have to be done? Does it have to be the best content ever? No, it has to be. It has to be content and put out. And, you know, I think so often people, you know, or not people, we all, you know, we, we stress over everything and, you know, you're putting together a recording. It doesn't sound yeah. exactly right. And all this stuff, Greg, on the other hand, he gets the, he, he gets a project, he finishes it, he puts it out and then he never looks back at it again, which is incredible, you know? Yeah. And so, and honestly, we've been able to take that on. And so, um, you know, and so I think that anyone out there who's trying to do stuff, it's just like, you know, we were fortunate. We had it out there and we, you know, we got a YouTube hit. Um, could it have been something else? Absolutely. And will it be something like now you can't put out a video on YouTube and go viral. It's because we're in a different, you know, it's, it's just, we're in a different age now. So people need to be you know, always up on things, but no question. Social media is, uh, incredible. And, and we have, uh, we've had great success from, uh, from the realm. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So, um, so on all my shows, I ask everyone what their crossroads like, screw this moment was where yeah. you were, you know, going down the path and um, you realized that you wanted to switch gears. And I know we talked about your audition with the Cleveland Orchestra. That may have been it. But, um, you know, maybe where you were at a low in your yeah. life. You know, I, I'd love to know about that. Yeah, I have, I have one. Um, certainly the, the, the one I told earlier uh, was the thing that kind of sent us forward on, uh, on Project Trio. But mm -hmm. much earlier in my career was right after I graduated – uh, from CIM, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so fresh out of college and I was in, I took a year off and I was in the Canton Symphony Orchestra, which was a great orchestra, regional orchestra. And I was just living in Cleveland. That's, that's what I was up to. And I honestly was unclear of what my life was going to be. And I remember, man, I think I even called my dad and I was like, I don't know, maybe I should just, I don't know, come home or, you know, come back to yeah. Texas. And yeah, I was only 22 or something, 23. And he's, and you know, and you know, he said to me, it was like, it was like January or February, which is the most terrible time to be in Cleveland. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I remember just, you know, like you say, I was down and yeah. he said, stick around get, you know, he was like, get back to work. And I think, 
then I was like, you know, okay, I am going to stick around. And I actually went into one of my most intense practicing phases of my life. I was like not even very close with many of my friends at that point. I had really like kind of fallen off. And I was practicing like eight, nine hours a day because I had the New World Symphony audition and the Chicago Civic uh, audition, you know, and I was like, this will be my, my out. And there was a part of me that was like, you know, if I don't get into this stuff, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I can stay up with this. I don't know if I can keep going. And yeah. I practiced, you know, like most intensely I ever, think I ever had. And uh, I got into both. And so uh, I actually was the runner up in New World. I went to Chicago for three months and then uh, uh, a bass player won a job and, and I got called and I went down to Miami. And um, it was an incredible experience. It changed my life. The New World Symphony uh, was uh, was definitely a, you know, kind of like a re restart and reboot of my my career which i think could have been a could have been an ending to my career but instead i you know kind of made it down there and i think it opened up a lot of opened up a lot of doors introduced me to a lot of my friends who i still am close with and and uh and a lot of a lot of other things actually so that's cool and plus the sun comes out there yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there was all kinds of nice things about the New World Symphony. <laughs> yeah, so it was a, it was a good uh, it was a good time. <laughs> That's awesome. I I subbed down there a little bit, and it was always fun. Especially I was in master's degree in Chicago, and I got to sub in Miami mm-hmm. with New World on occasion, and it was like paid vacation. It was so great. Absolutely. I had Maybe a very I, uh, I, for my three years there. I actually I I was. I was certainly living some kind of some kind of dream in that I was I also had a job in the Colorado Music Festival in Boulder. So I would play in Miami, you know, from September to May, and then I went out I would do a little driving tour of the United States and I would make my way out to Colorado and stay out there for seven weeks or so and uh and then uh, head back to Florida. So I was like uh, certainly no cares in the world. You summered in Colorado. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't summer in Miami because that's nope. pretty brutal. Yeah. You can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah awesome. that's, that's great. Well, yeah. I mean, I think we've all had those kind of low points, and I like oh, to yeah. talk about them because everyone's had them, you know. And you gotta you gotta power through them. Oh, you know? absolutely. I mean, I I'd, I'd say that certainly, uh, you know. I, I, again, I'll go back to just being goal oriented and, uh, and setting goals. And, you know, mm-hmm. again, it was, you know, I think I just reset and, and I was, was fortunate to have someone to give me a pep talk, which is my, my dad. And yeah. basically the pep talk was like, don't quit, go forward. And so, but then, you know, I kind of took the advice, but really what I did is I set a goal and, you know, went out there and got it. And I think before having that goal, I was a little bit, you know, just kind of, you know, aimless and just felt a little wandering. So again, I think, you know, just, you know, being goal oriented and if the goals don't work out. Oh, one thing I will say is that, um, with the business, most things don't work out. You know, we've had a lot of success in the trio, but I mean, seriously, uh, uh, I have tried to make, you know, for every concert we play, there is hundreds of hundreds if not a thousand concerts that we don't get to play people you know so uh honestly uh you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot a lot of uh uh downs in in doing doing this too we have so many rejections i can't even tell you it's way more rejections doing the trio than i ever had as an orchestral player because an orchestral player you only get a couple of chances so this is a with auditions, yeah. yeah, which is right. rough too when you only have a couple of chances, but lots yeah. and lots of rejection. Still, still, a lot of rejection still. That's interesting because, you know, from the outside you go, oh, Project Trio, they're killing it, you know, and, you know, you, you never hear about that stuff. I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to talk about it um, publicly necessarily, but I I think that's good a good thing to bring up, you know, because, um, yeah, that's part of business, right? Oh, Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, well, I think this is, co- you know, kind of, um, uh, not to get too into it because it's, uh, you know, it's almost cliche, but the, the whole idea that, um, you know, people put out there on social media what they want people to see. And yeah. so I'm not going to put out there all of our <laughs> rejection. <laughs> I'm going to put up a thing that says, again, oh, we played this awesome concert for all these kids in Jasper. It was amazing. A thousand kids. You know, meanwhile, not to, no offense to the people of Jasper, but, you know, <laughs> you know, wasn't exactly the crowning moment. But I will say that, you know, you, you know, you, and it's also, I think for people's lives, I think that social media, you know, it's a little strange kind of curating what you want people to see. But for yeah. your business, forget that. Your business, you need to curate it. You need to make it look awesome. And you know what? Don't ever, I think, you know, like, I don't like to post a lot of stuff personally on, on, uh, uh, social media, but I have no problem boasting about my business. And I think it's incredibly important to, to do so. So, you know, right. And you know, it's funny. We all know this about social media. We know it's curated information that we're getting about people's lives, but we still look at it and go, oh, they're perfect. And I, you know, I haven't done, you know, it's, yeah. we play all these mind games on ourselves. I'm realizing, oh. you know, oh, yeah. absolutely. And we do it as classical musicians, as business owners, all of that. And, and it's, you know, got to get the mind stuff out of the way. The mind trash needs to get taken out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing, but, um, but yeah, so a lot of downs, you know, so don't, uh, don't forget it. <laughs> okay. Um, I have, um, two more questions for you. Okay. Um, the first one is what, what is the one habit or behavior you've developed so far that has made a di- the most of a difference in your career? I'd say being organized. <laughs> <laughs> No, here's what it is. I, and me personally, and this is not for everyone, but you have to know yourself and like know, like really know your strengths and weaknesses. And that's part of this whole idea of being critical and why I think a lot of classical musicians can be successful in any career path they choose is that, you know, we're, we're like highly, uh, actually, we're intensely critical. But uh, one thing I've always been is I've been very early to bed and early to rise. And it's because when I get up, I have my lists ready and I get to work. I do a lot of work before my family gets up. I, I do a lot of work. Be- well, now my family gets up real early, but I do, <laughs> I do, a, I do a, a lot of work early in the morning and like get stuff going. So that way, you know, even by noon, I have knocked out so much stuff that then I can then, you know, even start building the, you know, lists for the next day and tackling things that always are coming up. And so, uh, you know, I think it's just, um, you know, knowing, uh, uh, knowing yourself and, you know, because some people actually work really well at night. But if you know you need to, if you know you work well at night, you need to set up your your life so that way you can do that. You know, right? And so that's why I was saying, like, I've I've always been an early riser, but I don't just get up early and then you know read a nice book and drink my coffee. I like <laughs> wake up and I'm like on, and I get to it and I get it and I get it done. So yeah, and with little ones in the house, you gotta you gotta focus. Yeah. On the time that you oh, yeah. that free, you know, that they're not making noise and stuff. Oh, I know. my goodness. Yes. Yeah. Little yeah. ones. <laughs> little ones. <laughs> little, little terrorizers. People. <laughs> little people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, totally. I love that because I have a tendency to uh, stay up too late sometimes. It's, and, you know, it's good because sometimes I can work at night, but... I like the early to bed, early to rise thing because well, there's some different feeling about the morning, isn't there? Like there's well, a. There is. But I will say that some people. It's so more of the advice is to to know yourself and right. because actually one of my closest friends still and one of my best friends in college, he was my college roommate. We were real opposites, and he's still he's a he's an attorney now, uh, managing partner at a firm, and he gets stuff done late. 
And it's weird. Like he'll, I'll get a text from him at 2 a.m., but it's because he's up. You know, he, he's terrible in the morning, but he knows himself. And, you know, he puts the family down and then works all night. So, you know, it's just, uh-huh. uh, you know, being, but I like the mornings, you know, so. Right. Cool. Um, and the uh, last question is who in the, well, who in the classical world inspires you the most? Yeah. You know, fortunately we are living in an incredible age to be a musician. Um, a lot of times, uh, there are so many ensembles out there doing it and doing it really big. And I follow all of my colleagues in the business and people that I, I watch. And these are all the different groups. Ice and Alarm Will Sound and Brooklyn Rider and Time for Three. And um, who else? I got all kinds of fans. Simply Three, Break a Reality, Sybarite Five. Um, you know, I, I all the, there's so many great groups. There's so much happening in the music world. And so I am following them all and seeing what they're doing and being impressed and driven by what they're doing and, and seeing what they're up to and then trying to, you know, come up with my new plans and, and make new plans. So I actually think that, um, you know, there's often a lot of doom and gloom out there surrounding the music world. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I do believe that for gigantic institutions like symphony orchestras that have huge budgets and rely quite a bit on uh, institutional giving, I believe that it is. It's hard times. It's, you know, it's harder. uh, It's harder to get people to give. You're not relying on your ticket sales. But that said, it's opened up this entire world of, you know, entrepreneurship, small yeah. businesses, smaller ensembles who are really touching communities. And they're able to even, you know, we're a nonprofit and we're able to get institutional giving. We're not, we're not, we don't rely on getting millions and millions of dollars, but we can get out there and get, you know, really close relationships with, with donors and supporters at a small level. And so I just say that it's wonderful it's there's no better time than now to be out there um, as an entrepreneur and as a, as 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 someone who wants to excel in this business because there is a, there's a lot of room you know for for uh, for that business. So I am impressed and uh, inspired by everyone who is out there um, making music and art and uh, and doing it their way. That's great. And I, I want to get that list from you because I some of the people I recognize that you listed and some of them I didn't. So I got a um, huge list. I'm, so anybody who I, I didn't, you know, people who listed, anyone who didn't, uh, I didn't mention too. There is just, there is, uh, there's incredible stuff happening. I find a new group every day. I was listening. I didn't yeah. ever hear these two guys. There's these two guys playing the, what's the little uh, piano you blow through? The melodica or? Oh, I don't even know what it's called, but oh. I've seen, I know what you're talking about. Two guys, they're like called the Melodica Men or something. <laughs> These guys are awesome. <laughs> and I saw I saw a YouTube or a video of them on Facebook that had millions and millions of views. And then I started checking them out and I saw they did a concert with an orchestra. I'm like, you no know. Way. So, but basically what I'm saying is every day I'm seeing new stuff that is really exciting and cool. And so um, I'm actually, uh, I, I even try to because honestly, when we started I feel like we were, you know, at the kind of dawn of a new age of, of this kind of, you know, entrepreneurship. And, uh, and I feel like we did a lot, not, not did a lot to help the movement, but like we were there at the beginning yeah. of a great movement. And so now actually I gotta, I have to even more cause now I'm getting old. I'm so now I even more, I like to go out there and see what the young groups are doing. Cause honestly, I, I'm not always sure what to do. You know? So I'm still on Facebook. I'm sure that's not the place where where uh, where, where young new audiences are. I guarantee you that. So, Got to get on Snapchat now. Exactly. But I am, um, you know, basically, I try to. Uh, I really do think that. Um, I think that it's so important to know the industry as much as you can yeah. and like research the industry. And I try to do that at all times. I have, um, uh, 
you know, well, anyways, long stories too, but I make lists of all this stuff and, and, you know, I'm always trying to follow the industry. Um, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I want to, I want, I want to say one thing, the project trio is starting a really new, uh, and cool initiative and it's called the studio and it is going to be in New York city for postgraduate students. It is a, uh, it is kind of a postgraduate program for aspiring entrepreneurs and, uh, and, um, with a focus on 21st century chamber music and doing awesome. this type of thing. It's in New York city and it's going to run a semester long uh if there are any people out there who are listening or are interested in that project trio.com come and find us we're looking for uh you know young musicians who are excited and it's going to be a really incredible program i'm looking forward to uh all the musicians uh again learning from all of them and hopefully passing on some knowledge that's awesome i'll make sure to put that link in the show notes so right. people can click on it that sounds great right. very cool i'd love to know more about that and Man, I feel like we could talk for hours. This was this has been a great interview, Peter. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you're doing. I've been listening and really? uh, I will continue to listen. So, um, Awesome, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, you too. And thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone for listening and if you're loving these interviews, please write a review on iTunes. And check me out at facebook.com slash crushing classical. <clears throat> I'm on Instagram at crushing classical as well. And I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Bye.